Chapter 51 Prior to the First Cataclysm, science dictated the natural laws of the world. Phenomena such as the creation of the universe, the extinction of dinosaurs, the life cycle of planets, everything was explained through the usage of science. Dot yet, as soon as Monarch came into the world, things that science dictated to be impossible became possible. Summoning fireballs, splitting mountains, turning invisible, running at speeds that the naked eye couldn't see. Despite how much scientists tried to rack their brains around it, they couldn't explain such phenomena. The world's standards changed. What we previously thought we knew had to be reviewed. That was because of the existence of a new index, MANA. In 2015, Dmitry Morlov, a scientist of Russian descent proposed a new scientific branch called magic. Magic used to be a word to describe petty tricks that fooled the human eyes, yet now Dmitry Morlov proposed for it to become a new scientific branch that stood with the likes of physics, chemistry, and biology. At first, all major political authorities disagreed. How could they suddenly change the system that they had been using for centuries? They thought that as time passed they would be able to incorporate the existence of mana into the current scientific standards. Dot, but as time passed and people learned more about mana, their ideology changed, and finally in 2032 magic was approved as a new scientific branch. Magical research. This was the name of the class one was currently headed to. It was also the class that assistant professor Gilbert von Dexteroy taught. The secret head of the blood supremacist group that dominated the academy alongside the two other major groups, Noblesse and Empire's Sword. Despite there being many factions inside of the academy, blood supremacist, Noblesse and Empire's Sword were the ones that had the most influence and members. The Noblesse faction had a similar concept to blood supremacist in the fact that they only accepted people with certain statuses. However, in contrast to them, they weren't as radical. They didn't despise people just because of their lineage and wealth. Most of the members in Noblesse didn't even get to choose to join the faction as it was decided beforehand by their parents. Emma and Melissa too were forced to join because of their parents' influence. If everything went according to the plotline, during the last month of their second year, they would both be elected as the heads of the faction. Lastly, there was Empire's Sword. Unlike the other major faction, Empire's Sword didn't select members based on their lineage or status. It only focused on individual strength. In order to enter, you must prove that you were worthy of holding their name. As such, the requirement to joining the faction was to defeat a senior member. Only upon proving your strength could you enter the faction. Ranks within the faction were also determined by strength, with the head of the faction being the current rank one of the third year. Those were the three major factions, and fortunately for me, I managed to avoid getting on their radar, allowing me to have a fairly carefree life. Despite the fact that being in a faction had many perks, it also came with many disadvantages. Most notably the fact that you had less time for yourself. Because I was quite behind the rest of the protagonists when I had reincarnated in this world, I needed all the time I could spare to train myself so that I could catch up to them. Because of how talented they were, catching up to them was not going to be an easy task. A month and a half had passed since reincarnating in this world and I wasn't even close to surpassing Emma whose rank was currently less than Ita, let alone Kevin the main protagonist whose rank was less than E plus greater than borderline less than D greater than. Simply put, I did not have time to waste on hidden politics. Fortunately, as if God had heeded my prayer, now that Elijah was found to be a villain, my elective was suspended indefinitely granting me more time to train. With the potions that Melissa has made for me, my training speed has seen a massive boost. If things kept going at this speed, it wouldn't take too long for me to reach the less than F greater than rank. Whistling happily, I headed to my class in a good mood. However, my good mood only lasted for a split second because as soon as I stepped outside of my dorm I caught sight of something that I didn't want to see. Not so far from where I was standing, I could see first and second years glaring at each other. Some were even close to resorting to physical violence. If not for their friends holding them back, a fight would have already broken out. Dot dot dot. The conflicts within the academy were slowly getting out of control. It had gotten to the point that even innocent bystanders were starting to get swept into the conflict. I could no longer walk without worrying about my safety. With the backing of his father, Fabian managed to hide his involvement regarding the conflicts, preventing the professors from finding out what was truly happening. Fabian's goal with these conflicts was simple. Create as much chaos as possible. Make the professors focus on the conflicts within the academy rather than Emma. It was all proceeding as he planned. The only upside about this situation was that everything was proceeding as I predicted. There were no changes to this scenario, allowing me to take a load off my back. As long as the plotline didn't change I could still exploit the fact that I knew the future. As long as the plotline more or less remained the same I could have some peace of mind. I arrived in my class and sat in my usual seat and waited for, Assistant Professor, Gilbert to start the lecture. Since he wasn't a professor yet, he could only be referred to as, Assistant Professor. The class was unusually chatty today, with some male and female students excited about the upcoming class. The primary reason for their excitement was because of the person who was teaching them today. Eagerly looking at the front of the class, everyone's eyes paused on a young individual with dirt blonde hair. 
He had a noble air around him that made him look like an aristocrat from ancient times and his features that were relatively handsome made some of the girls in class blush. Gilbert von Dexteroy. Not only was he extremely talented and managed to become an assistant professor at the tender age of 22, but he was also the son of the third-ranked hero, Thundergod, Maximus von Dexteroy, one of the seven heads of the Union. Standing in front of the podium, Gilbert sorted some of the papers in his hands. He looked very serious and though some students wanted to approach him, he quickly shooed them away. At five on the dot, he looked up and began speaking. Welcome to Magical Research. Our course will primarily be focused on mana and what it consists of. We will also look at how the mana from the atmosphere circulates around our body as we speak. What enables us to wield supernatural powers and how it has affected us in our daily lives. As he started speaking, everyone in the class started paying close attention to his words. It wasn't because of his influence, but rather because of how important this class was. For future heroes, this class was extremely important. Not only did it teach the basics of how mana worked, but it also helped students better understand their powers. Mana is nothing but a bundle of elements, fire, water, earth, wind, light, darkness, and so on. Mana is essentially a package that contained all of the elements, and those said elements are what we now refer to as science. Looking around the class to make sure everyone understood, Gilbert continued. It's fairly simple. When we use mana, all we are doing is actually using the science within the package mana to fit our needs. Take summoning a fireball as an example. Extending his hand forward, a wave of heat spread across the classroom as a large fireball that resembled a sun appeared on Gilbert's palm. To do this all I did was channel the mana inside of my body and visualized a fireball. But how does simply channeling mana create a fireball? Looking at the large fireball in Gilbert's hand, every student eagerly awaited his next words. They too were curious. Since young, most of the students were taught how to channel mana without actually knowing the reason behind their actions. It was like learning how to breathe but not actually knowing why they were breathing. Everyone wanted to know. Smiling at everyone's enthusiasm, Gilbert continued. In reality, what you are doing is merely stimulating the fire sign within the bundle of mana so that you can materialize fire like I just did. Mana follows the wave particle theory, meaning that it behaves similarly to both particles and waves, when we use mana. As he was continuing his demonstration, just like the others, I couldn't help but be entranced by his explanations. Though he was an absolute scum of a person, I had to say, he was a really good teacher. His voice was crisp and pleasant, and he didn't leave any detail out when explaining the class contents. Even for someone like me who had only been in this world for a month and a half, the lecture was easy to understand. Although I was not a mage, this lecture was still very useful for me. Though it may not seem like it, I used mana when I practiced the kiki style. Just like the professor had explained, mana was just a bundle of science that represented different elements, and for my swordsmanship, the main sign that I used was the wind sign. I was able to achieve such a high degree of speed because the Kiki style used wind scions to synergize with my sword movement, enabling it to achieve speeds that the naked eye couldn't see. Grandmaster Kiki had stipulated that at the pinnacle of the Kiki style, the wind scion was no longer the main scion that was used but it was in fact the light scion. He believed that only upon the usage of light scions did someone reach the realm of perfection of the Kiki style. I was still a far cry from that level, but at least I got a better idea of what to do when training. Dot dot dot. As Gilbert was continuing his lecture, out of nowhere someone raised their hand up. Yes. Pausing and looking up, Gilbert's eyes wandered towards the student who had just raised his hand. Seeing that he had gotten the professor's attention, standing up, an extremely handsome individual with red eyes and black hair spoke. Professor, if what you said is true then why can't we separate the signs individually so that we can use spells more efficiently? Instantly the class became silent. Soon Kevin found everyone staring at him. Some were frowning, some were laughing, and some were ridiculing him. Even Gilbert couldn't help but let out a small chuckle. Now, calm down everyone. It is only normal that he doesn't know this considering that he had only just entered the academy. Without hiding his disdain, Gilbert continued. Though I am surprised you don't know this Kevin, let me explain it for you. The reason why scions are bundled together and are not separate is because of the law of conservation of energy. A single scion by itself would simply disintegrate in the air because it is unstable. Only when it is with the other scions can it remain stable. As Gilbert was lecturing Kevin, I had already stopped focusing. I was deep into my own thoughts. For the past two weeks, I had been stuck in the threshold of the minor reel of mastery of the Kiki style. No matter how much I trained I couldn't quite make that leap to the next level in my sword training. Dot but after hearing Gilbert's lecture, it finally dawned on me. The key to why I couldn't break through to the next realm of sword mastery. Science. Chapter 52. Foo. Inside of a dimly lit bedroom, a young boy let out a long breath as he sat cross-legged. A white glow pulsated around his body, increasing and decreasing constantly. Focusing my mind, I tried to feel the mana around me. After having listened to Gilbert's lecture I managed to grasp the missing key to my roadblock. Mana control. I needed to have better control of my mana. 
More precisely, I needed to have better control of wind scions. Since the Kiki style required me to harness wind scions in a way that it coated around my sword so that it could propel it forward, I needed to have a better understanding and control of them. By having better control of wind scions, not only would I become more efficient, but I would also be able to increase the speed of my sword movement. Evening my breathing, I focused entirely on my surroundings. I slowly felt the mana circulating around me. The more I focused the more I felt like I was underneath the sea, surrounded by water. It felt boundless. Foo. Sucking in my breath, I channeled the mana around me into my body. Slowly the white glow around me increased, extending out from my body. Closing my eyes, I focused on grasping the concepts of wind. What was wind? Wind referred to the movement of gases from high pressure to low pressure areas. High pressure low pressure slowly the white glow around me brightened. Shuam. After a couple of minutes, abruptly opening my eyes, I reached for the sword that sat next to me. Standing up, I positioned myself into my sword stance and focused entirely on what was ahead of me. The world around me disappeared and all that was left was an empty white world with me in the middle. The second movement of the Kiki style, horizon splitting slash. Shuua. Like a lightning bolt, a bright white light enveloped the room, it left as fast as it came, instantaneous. Opening my eyes, a satisfied smile appeared on my face, though it didn't last long as a long horizontal scar appeared on the wall. Crap. Hurrying over to the wall that I had just slashed with my sword, I traced my finger along the long horizontal scar that I left on the wall. Feeling how deep it was I couldn't help but curse out loud. There went a couple of thousand you damn it. Originally, I was supposed to go to the training grounds to practice, but because I needed to hide the fact that I practice a five-star module, I was left with the only option of practicing in my room. The commotion of my breakthrough would have just been too big. Moreover with all the cameras installed, hiding what I was doing was impossible. In the end, I could only lament the fact that I didn't have my own personal training ground. Shaking my head, I slumped back on the ground as fine droplets of sweat dripped from my forehead. Laughing bitterly, I looked at my status. Equals 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 status equals equals equals. Name. Ren Dover Rank. F Strength. F Agility. F. Stamina. F Intelligence. F. Mana Capacity. F Luck. E. Charm. G. Greater than Profession. Swordsmanship Libel.2. The degree of understanding of the sword has evolved to the next level. User will find it easier to understand concepts that were previously harder to understand. Greater than Martial Manual. Kiki Style, Minor Realm of Mastery. Sword Art Created by Grandmaster Toshimoto Kiki. A five-star module that focused primarily on reaching the apex of swordsmanship and speed. Upon mastery, the sword art becomes so fast that before an opponent could even think about their next move, their heads would already be rolling on the ground. Greater than skills. G. Monarch's Indifference. A skill that enables users to erase all emotions, and act as a supreme monarch that only calculates the best option regardless of circumstance. Equals 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 equals. Looking at my stats, my brows involuntarily twitched due to one of the attributes refusal to increase. On the bright side, I had finally managed to reach less than F greater than rank. I had originally thought that I still needed a couple of weeks to a month before getting promoted to less than F greater than rank, but it seems like my breakthrough had also helped me increase my stats. Another factor that contributed to my sudden rise in rank was probably Melissa's potions. Since they were made by her, the quality was probably on the higher end of the spectrum compared to what was sold on the market. This probably contributed to my sudden increase in rank. I could now proudly say that I was at least within the top 150 if not top 100 in our year. Though I was still not in the top ranks, I was slowly catching up to the others. It didn't matter how long it took, all I needed to know was that I was slowly achieving it. One day, I would slowly but surely become strong enough to overcome any challenges I faced. I didn't want to be helpless again like the time I was in the dungeon. Looking back at my status window, I couldn't help but notice that my swordsmanship had leveled up to 2. As my understanding of the sword increased, so did my profession. The higher the profession level, the higher the understanding you had of the profession. Moreover, the more your profession level increased, the easier it was to understand previously daunting problems. It was like my comprehension had been increased. With my newfound knowledge, I was instantly able to find the flaws of my current fighting style. Despite how good the Kiki style was, I was currently too weak to wield it. Looking back at my previous fights, I remembered always finding myself in a pickle after not being able to finish my opponent on my first hit. I only knew how to attack but not defend. Once I attacked I wasted too much time trying to regain my stance. Because I was still a newbie with the Kiki style, I wasted too much time transitioning from one stance to the other. This in turn allowed the enemy to regain their bearing, completely removing the element of surprise. Moreover, from my experience, I found that in between the time that I was switching stance I was basically helpless. I needed something that created synergy with the Kiki style, something that bought me time so that I could regain my stance. My first thought was obviously getting another skill, 
but considering how expensive and rare they were I could only discard such thought. My next thought was whether I should buy an artifact. If I bought an artifact that created a shield around me after every attack, it could easily solve my problem. Dot but in the end, similarly to skills, I couldn't afford it. Despite the fact that I had 6 million U with me, it was not nearly enough to purchase an artifact that met my precise requirement. In the end, I was left with one option. Learn another sword art. This was probably the easiest method and most appropriate method. There was more than one reason as to why this was the most appropriate choice, but the biggest of them all was that I was in urgent need of a sword art that I could use in the absence of the Kiki style. For obvious reasons, if news were to spread that I was in possession of a five-star manual, I could kiss my daily life goodbye as I would be hounded by greedy bastards left and right. It was fine if they were just targeting me, but since I had parents, my every action had to also consider them in the picture. I was no longer alone. Thinking thus far, I knew that I had to mask my real sword art. Dot and what better way to hide that fact than by practicing another one. This way, I could hide my strength from everyone's sight even better. The fewer the loopholes, the better. Plus, if I chose a defense-orientated sword art and if I could use it alongside the Kiki style, my strength would see another boost. It was simply a win-win. Dot now all I had to do was find the appropriate sword art. A couple of ones came into my head, but they were either too hard to get or were too expensive. The academy also provided them, but you had to have a certain amount of merits in order to use them. I currently had zero. After a long time of me trying to rack my brain over this issue, I decided to leave it for later. It'll eventually hit me. There was no point in trying to think of the solution to a problem in my current circumstances. I was already exhausted from breaking through. There was no point in thinking when my brain capacity was currently at its limit. It'll eventually hit me. Laying down on my bed, I picked up the mysterious red book that I had gotten from the package my mom had sent me. Things have been quiet on Kevin's side. Nothing particularly exciting happened apart from the slight conflict he had with Gilbert at the end of the lesson. I was too immersed in my own enlightenment to witness the conflict. But what essentially happened was that Kevin and Gilbert had a verbal dispute with each other at the end of the lecture. It was a tit for tat. It didn't escalate to a full-blown fight, but it certainly increased the enmity between the two. Especially Gilbert who already hated Kevin with a passion. Looking through the book and seeing that there was nothing particularly exciting, I closed the book in my hands and prepared to sleep. Regarding the book, one more thing I found out about it was that it couldn't be stored inside of a dimensional space. This was a bummer because it meant that I would essentially have to carry it with me everywhere from now on. Though I didn't use the book much, if the situation called for it, I was always ready to make use of its future alternating properties. Dot but as of now I only used the book to see how Kevin and the story were progressing. There just wasn't a need for me to use it as of now. I mean, although there were some hiccups here and there, the plotline was proceeding as it should be, and because Kevin still didn't have any major conflicts I didn't really feel the need to use it. Ding. Dong. Just as I was about to close my eyes and sleep, the sound of my doorbell ringing could be heard. Hum. Who could it be? Sitting up on my bed, I looked in the direction of the door in confusion. I don't recall ordering anything. Frowning, I tried to remember if I had a prior engagement, but I soon shook my head. I wasn't expecting any packages nor expecting someone. Maybe my parents ordered something for me, but I don't recall them ever mentioning anything about this. A myriad of questions entered my mind as I headed for the door. In the end, because I was too tired, I thought nothing of it and opened the door. I wasn't popular enough to have someone actively looking for me. How can I hell? Halfway through my sentence, I froze. Standing in front of me stood a stunningly beautiful young girl with glossy black hair that gently fell down all the way to her waist. Her black crystal clear eyes looked directly at me and though she wasn't as tall as me, we could see each other at eye level. After a moment of pause, she said. May I come in? No words came from my mouth. I was so shocked at the moment that I just stood there dumbly. I was totally caught off guard. Tilting her head to the side, and seeing the state I was in, the young girl without waiting for me to respond entered my room. It was evident that such a situation was within her expectations. Clank. Snapping me out of my daze was the sound of the door closing as the young girl entered my room. Turning around, a complicated look appeared on my face. Why would Amanda suddenly show up in my room? Chapter 53 the air around the room was tense. It felt suffocating. Almost as if I was stuck inside of a cramped room with no room to breathe. The reason for such atmosphere. Quietly sitting on my chair, a stunningly beautiful young girl with glossy black hair and porcelain white skin devoid of any imperfections, was curiously looking around my room. Amanda Stern. Someone who I had never thought of interacting with privately. Seeing her sit on my seat as if it was the most natural thing to do, my eyebrows twitched. Just what did I do to deserve this? No, I knew why, I just wanted to deny reality. Sighing, I spoke up to try to break the awkward atmosphere. Would you like green tea or water? Hearing my voice, Amanda's eyes paused on my face for a couple of seconds and after a short pause she said. Green tea, alright, heading to where my teapot was stashed, I took it out and poured steaming hot water into the pot. 
After a couple of seconds, I took a bag filled with tea leaves and gently threw them into the pot. While waiting for the tea to be ready, I turned around and noticed Amanda's obsidian black eyes staring at me. Taken aback by her odd behavior, I asked, need something? Hearing my voice and seeing that I had caught her red-handed, Amanda looked to the side and acted as if nothing happened as she lightly murmured. Nothing, smiling, I looked back at the teapot. What do you mean nothing? You were obviously staring at me. Even a blind person could tell you were looking at me. Pinching my brows, I decided to think about this in a positive way. From the looks of things, it at least seemed that she had no hard feelings against me. Since I knew her personality well, I knew that if she were to have had a grudge against me, she would have avoided me at all costs. Treating me as if I was non-existent. Seeing how she had actively come looking for me, I knew that she didn't hold what happened against me. So what did she come here for? There was definitely a reason for her visit. I sort of had a hunch on what it was, but I wasn't too sure. Most likely, she came to express her gratitude for saving her. If so, I better get this over with fast. If someone found out, the Amanda Stern, who was the talk of the academy was having a private meeting with a boy in his own room, I wouldn't even know how I died. The fact that she was in my room meant that my life was in danger. Sigh. Just when I thought things weren't going to become more troublesome suddenly a new troublesome situation arose. Looking at the water in the teapot that had started turning murky brown, I carefully removed the teapot from the heater and poured the tea into two porcelain teacups. Walking back to where Amanda was seated, I handed the steaming hot teacup to her and sat in front of her. Thank you, taking the teacup with both hands, Amanda gently blew on the cup and took a sip. Closing her eyes and savoring the taste of the tea, Amanda nodded slightly said. It's good, thank you, sitting in front of her, I also took a sip of the tea. It had a slightly bitter aftertaste that even after a couple of seconds lingered at the tip of my tongue, it was quite good. So, what did you want to talk about? Seeing that we couldn't just spend all the time drinking tea, I decided to get straight to the point. Placing the teacup down, Amanda's indifferent face stared at me. After a while, she finally spoke. Thank you, frowning slightly, I said, for what? For saving me, shaking my head, I leaned back on my chair and said. I don't ever recall helping you, yo. Just as she was about to answer, I cut her off. It seems like you forgot what I had told you before. Forget what you saw, listening to my last sentence and remembering what I had said, Amanda remained quiet for a little bit. Her brows continuously knit and relaxed, and after a while, she shook her head and apologetically said. I can't do that. Rolling my eyes, I placed my teacup down. Her response was within my expectations. Staring at her crystal black eyes that were looking back at me, I thought for a moment before saying. Sigh. All right if you're really sorry then give me some money. Hearing my reply, Amanda sighed in relief. She was visibly relieved by my request. Okay, taking out her phone, she quickly went to her bank account. Seeing her like this, I couldn't help but bitterly shake my head. Amanda's personality was just like this, she disliked owing anyone anything. She didn't want to feel indebted to anyone other than herself. No, it was more like she only trusted herself and herself alone. She made sure to pay back every single favor she owed so that she wouldn't build any unrealistic expectations of others. Is five million you fine? Five million you? I guessed a. Sipping on my tea, I initially nodded apathetically, but as soon as I processed what she had said, I almost spat all my tea on her face. Ha! Ah, what did you just say? Innocently looking at me who had just stood up and was looking at her with wide eyes, Amanda said. Is five million, not enough? What do you mean that's not enough, that's plenty? Waving my hand, I immediately shut her down. Damn rich second generation kids treating money as if it was nothing. So five million okay. Sigh, hold on, slumping back on my chair, I started thinking. 5 million you would definitely help me. With that much money, I could pretty much solve the problem of finding a sword manual. Ah. Looking at Amanda, an idea suddenly came into mind. Can I ask for something else instead of money? Frowning lightly, the room temperature dropped and Amanda's demeanor became increasingly colder. Understanding that she was probably misunderstanding something, I quickly followed up by saying. No, I am not asking for any dates or anything that is remotely close to that. Hearing my next part, Amanda's brows relaxed. Nodding her head she said. Okay, sighing in relief, I said, can you get me a sword manual? A sword art? Taken aback by my request, Amanda looked at me strangely. At first, I was confused by her reaction, but remembering what had happened a few nights ago I realized why. I am looking for something to disguise my main sword art. Oh, as if she understood something, Amanda nodded. Seeing her react like that, I knew she still had a misconception about my strength. In the end, I said nothing. I was honestly too tired to solve the misunderstanding. Plus no matter how much I'll try to solve the misunderstanding, chances were that she wouldn't believe me. In the end, it didn't really matter if she misunderstood or not. At the end of the day, she wasn't the type of person to treat people differently regardless of her strength. Moreover, she wasn't a blabbermouth, meaning that my secret was pretty safe. What type of sword art would you like? 
thinking for a bit, I said. Let's see, I would like a sword art that primarily focused on defense. Touching her chin for a second, Amanda pondered for a moment before saying. How many stars? Hmm, since you were previously offering me around 5 million you, I guess something that went along that price. Thinking for a bit, Amanda scrolled through her phone for a couple of seconds before nodding. Okay, let me have a look, turning on the holographic function on the phone, a long list of sword manuals appeared before me. This is what I got from the criteria that you had given me. Seeing the long list of manuals, my mouth twitched. If I said I wasn't jealous right now, that would be a lie. Dot dot dot, as expected of the daughter of the guild master of the number one guild in the human domain, Demon Hunter. She had access to an immeasurable amount of resources and manuals that would cause anyone to turn green from envy. For the next few minutes, we went through the long catalog of sword manuals that Amanda had access to. After a while, and a lot of contemplation I finally decided on the sword art I wanted. Ring of Vindication, highly advanced sword art that creates a perfect ring of defense around the user. Upon mastery, the ring can create a three-dimensional sphere that protects the user from all sides. Because of the lack of offensive capabilities, the manual was graded three stars. Talk about a perfect sword manual. Though it was a three-star manual, it was in fact a four-star manual if the only thing that was taken into consideration was its defensive properties. This went along perfectly with my wishes as this was exactly what I needed. Ring of Vindication, for defense and the Kiki style, for offense. This was exactly what I wanted. After selecting Ring of Vindication, Amanda nodded and messaged someone. Soon the room was enveloped in an awkward silence. After a couple of minutes of silence, Amanda stood up and said. Thank you for meeting me, I'll take my leave. No problem. Smiling, I escorted her out of my apartment, I could finally be free. Arriving at the door, Amanda indifferently waved her hand. Goodbye, smiling, I waved back and said, see you. Dot dot dot, leaving Ren's room, Amanda was satisfied with the outcome of their meeting. She more or less got a better understanding of the student that had helped her. His personality was a far cry from what it was when they met at the party. Despite no longer hiding the fact that he was hiding his strength, his demeanor did not return to what it was back in at the party. Cold and emotionless. He was a far cry from that. He wasn't cold nor emotionless. He was calm and collected, and despite the fact that she was standing in the same room as him, it didn't seem like he was entranced by her beauty which was a first. His demeanor was completely different from what a regular 16-year-old kid should have. He was neither overbearing nor arrogant, and aside from the fact that his expression was really easy to read, he was quite easy to talk to. It felt like she was talking to an adult. It honestly felt weird. Walking along the corridor of the dorm, she suddenly noticed many eyes staring in her direction. What is Amanda doing in the horn sheep dorm? Was she meeting with someone? Nah, she was probably coming to check on something. There's no way Amanda would talk to those peasants living in the horn sheep dorm. Along the way, Amanda heard people whispering amongst each other as she walked back to her dorm. Being used to such attention, she promptly ignored what they were saying and exited the building. Taking out her phone she quickly dialed a number. Ring, ring, ring. After a couple of seconds, an aged voice entered Amanda's ears. Hello. How may I help you, young miss? Because Amanda disliked making small talk, she immediately got straight to the point. Send the three-star manual, Ring of Vindication, at the location I messaged you a while ago. After a short pause, the person on the other side of the phone spoke. Very well. Thank you, talk. Hanging up the phone, Amanda felt a weight lift off her chest. Turning back towards the horned sheep building, she lightly murmured. Now I don't owe you anything. Chapter 54 Six days had passed since the meeting with Amanda, and just like she had promised, my new sword manual arrived the next day. When I first opened the package and saw the manual, I was once again reminded of how much influence Amanda had in the Demon Hunter Guild. The manual looked like it had just been freshly copied, with no creases or stains on it. It had to be noted that it was not that easy to make a copy of a manual. Because for obvious reasons guilds were trying to minimize the circulation of manuals, a lot of procedures had to be taken before being allowed to make a copy of a manual. It had to be approved by a vast majority of the board members in the guild master, and this was especially hard since a lot of the members were conservative people that hated sharing things with outsiders. Simply put, the fact that Amanda was able to give me a copy the next day meant that she had just as much influence as her father, the guild master. That aside, during these past six days, since I had nothing to do, as soon as the manual arrived I decided to train it. Surprisingly, because my swordsmanship had improved to level 2, I was able to grasp the contents of my new manual fairly quickly. Though I was nowhere near reaching the minor realm of mastery, the time it would take me to reach that level would be a lot faster compared to what it took me to reach that level with my main sword art. Though I said that, it would still take me quite a while before I could reach that level of mastery. Unlike the Kiki style, which had five stances, Ring of Vindication, had three levels which were, Ring of Aegis, Gravitational Ring, and Elemental Alternation. The first level, Ring of Aegis, created a ring in the air that acted as a shield. 
how strong its defense was depended on the degree of mastery of the sword art. The second level was a more advanced version of the first level, Ring of Aegis, and added a gravitational pull on the ring that redirected all the attacks towards the ring. This was extremely useful, as only one ring needed to be created to defend rather than multiple rings to deflect multiple attacks coming from different directions. This way, I didn't have to split my focus on defending different areas. Lastly, the third level, Elemental Alternation. This level consisted of manipulating scions in a way that the ring attained elemental attributes. This was extremely useful in countering elemental attacks, as fire attacks could be countered with a water-attributed ring. However, in order for one to be able to pull this move, they had to have a high degree of mana control. They had to be able to harness the precise scion they wanted to use and create a ring with it. That alone was incredibly hard to do, and if someone did not reach a certain level of mastery towards mana control it would impossible. These were the three levels of Ring of Vindication, and the first time I learned about their effect I couldn't close my jaw for a whole hour. After the shock died down, what replaced it was pure excitement as I couldn't wait to start practicing it. Dot and here I was now, six days later standing in the middle of the training ground practicing the first level, Ring of Aegis. Foo. Sucking in a deep breath, I closed my eyes and slowly drew a ring in front of me with my sword. In the process of doing so, I focused entirely on channeling my mana to the tip of my sword. Slowly as I drew the circle in the air, if one looked closely, a dimly lit line followed the tip of my sword. After one full circulation, it formed a yellow ring in the air. However, exactly two seconds after I drew the circle, it broke down and scattered in the air. Opening my eyes and looking at the scattering circle, I let out a satisfied smile. Two seconds. Though it didn't seem like much, in the first three days I could barely even draw a full circle. That's how much I progressed these past few days. However, I was still far cry from reaching the point where I could actively use this sword art. Although I could create a ring that lasted for two seconds, it could barely be used to defend. It still had no substance to it, meaning that right now it was nothing but a beautiful decoration. One thing I noticed these past few days, as I was practicing the sword art, was how flawed the grading system for manuals was. Despite the fact that, Ring of Vindication, had no offensive properties, if one practiced this art to the fullest, I would doubt anyone could penetrate its defenses. It may have not been a 5-star manual, but it could definitely have been a 4-star manual with its defense alone. This was especially so if one considers the fact that the greater the mastery of the sword art one had, the stronger it would become. If one day I were to reach the perfected realm of mastery, no, even the essence realm of mastery, I would without a doubt not have to worry about my defense. That said, I shouldn't get ahead of myself. I was still very far from reaching that level. Let's not delude ourselves. Click. Placing my sword back into the scabbard, I looked at my watch. It was precisely 8 p.m., and because tomorrow was the day of the trip I decided to head back and rest. If things were going to progress just like I thought they would, I needed all the rest I could get. Looking at the darkening sky, I murmured, this is going to be one hell of a trip. Parker Tower, Ashton City. Knox sitting at his desk looking through some papers, Michael Parker the current head of the Parker family, heard a knock coming from the other side of the door. Come in, putting the papers down, Michael looked in the direction of the door. Opening the door, an elegant elderly individual with a butler outfit entered the room. He had long white hair accompanied by a finely trimmed mustache that rested below his nose. Despite his age, his face barely had any wrinkles and aside from the pigmentation of his mustache and hair, someone could have easily mistaken him for a 40-year-old man. Greetings master. Elegantly bowing in front of Michael Parker, the butler looked at his master and waited for him to speak. Are the preparations ready? Looking at the butler before him, Michael's authoritative voice rang across the room. Yes master, everything has been prepared. Hearing the butler's response, Michael nodded slightly. Pausing for a moment and looking at Ashton City from the window he said. Dot has the trivet squad been dispatched. Hearing the word, trivet, being mentioned, the butler's demeanor faltered for a split second before recovering. Yes. Everything is as you have ordered. Good, letting out a satisfied smile, Michael slumped on his chair and lightly murmured. With the trivet squad in charge of this case, I don't have to worry about anything. Looking at Michael Parker with a complicated look, the old butler couldn't hold it anymore and said. Sir, though it may be rude of me, are you sure you want to send the trivet squad for this mission? As soon as those words escaped the butler's mouth, the temperature of the room dropped to freezing points. A strong oppressive force started emanating from Michael as he looked at his butler. Richard, it seems that I have been too lenient with you. Despite having served me for over 15 years, you still doubt my decisions? Subjected to such immense pressure, cold sweat dripped from Richard's back as he immediately lowered his head. And no, Aiju T thought that after raising them for so long, it would be a waste to let them go just like this. Smirking, Michael shook his head. Naive, this is the best time for the Trivet Squad to come into play. This mission requires the assassination of several high-profiled individuals whose backing is just as strong as our family if not even more, a single failure could cause everything that my father and grandfather had built to go down the drain. 
Looking back at the butler, Michael coldly said. If anyone catches wind of what we are planning, the fate of the Parker family would be on the line. A single mistake and we could very well be wiped out from the face of this planet. Only if we utilize the Tribbett Squad will we be able to complete our plan without worrying about it implicating us. Squinting his eyes, the pressure around Michael intensified many folds. Oop. Do you understand why I am employing the Tribbett Squad? Understood, struggling to adjust himself to the pressure, Richard forced himself to nod. The pressure was too much for him. Good, letting out a satisfied smile, the pressure around the room dissipated. Feeling the massive pressure lift from him, Richard finally managed to catch his breath. After a while, a complicated look appeared on his face. There was only one reason for his sense of discomfort. The Trivet Squad, an elite squad that was secretly raised by the Parker family and created for the sole purpose of killing high-profile targets. Each member, who were raised from a very young age, had no other purpose to their life aside from serving the Parkers. They were essentially discardable elite soldiers. Once used, they would be killed. They were a one-time use squad. Regardless of whether they succeeded or not, they were fated to die after completing the mission. The reason for such a procedure was because the Parkers didn't want to leave behind any loopholes in case any of their missions failed. Even if they succeeded or failed, no other person apart from a few trusted individuals could know what they had done. The fewer people that knew the better. Dot you may go. After seeing that his butler had somewhat understood his intentions, Michael waved his hand and dismissed him. As you wish. Standing up, the butler bowed once again before leaving and closing the door on the way out. Soon, Michael was left alone in his office. Looking at the papers in his hands, Michael's eyes paused on a few profiles. Kevin Voss, Emma Rochefield, Amanda Stern, Jin Horton. Han Yu Fei, Melissa Hall. Those were just a few of the names of the people he was planning to have assassinated during the Academy start of year trip. He was planning on killing them all. He planned to kill all of the individuals who were either too talented or were direct competitors of the Parker family. Twenty years. That's how long he had been training the Trivet Squad. It was all for this moment. He wanted to deal a fatal blow to all of his competitors, one that would cause them to lose what was most precious to them. He wanted them to despair. He wanted them to suffer a pain that was worse than death, just like what he had been through all those years ago. Reaching for the corner of his desk, Michael flipped over an old wooden picture frame. Staring at the photo behind the picture frame, Michael's indifferent face slightly softened as he lightly caressed the glass on the frame. After a couple of seconds, his fingers started trembling and his voice shook. Soon my dear. I'll see you soon, talk. Closing his eyes and taking a deep breath, Michael flipped the picture frame down. It took a couple of seconds before he was able to revert back to his previous indifferent demeanor. Standing up, Michael walked to the edge of his office, where thick reinforced glass replaced the walls, allowing him to overlook the whole of Ashton City. Interlocking his hands behind his back, he coldly murmured. Halberg will be the first step to my revenge, Chapter 55. All right. Everyone please enter the bus, wearing a loosely fit white t-shirt that was neatly tucked in her jeans, Donna did a quick roll call. As she was doing the roll call, her every movement attracted the attention of every boy present. Her violet eyes shone slightly causing everyone to fall into a daze. I too was entranced by her. After making sure that everyone in class A25 was present, Donna, taking no notice of the boys' flushed faces, boarded a huge white bus and urged us to follow along. Right after her figure disappeared inside of the bus, the boys snapped out of their daze and regained their senses. Seeing the confused look on everyone's faces I couldn't help but lightly shake my head. This scene was too familiar. This was not the first time it happened and it probably wasn't going to be the last time it happened. Donna, whenever she was in a bad mood, tended to unconsciously release some of her powers causing all the boys in class to suddenly feel extremely infatuated with her. Sometimes it would get so bad that some of the guys would directly faint. Only the likes of Kevin and Jin were somewhat able to remain unaffected by her sudden seductive outburst. Regaining my composure, and looking at the others who were boarding the bus, I couldn't help but stare at the bus which Donna had just entered. I was in complete awe. The bus's outer body was painted in white, and its smooth design was slick and modern. The bus, which was enormous, measuring up to 15 meters in length, could house up to 200 people. The reason why the bus was able to hold that many people was because it had a second floor which surprisingly had a mini snack bar. Around the bus, all the windows were tinted in black making it impossible to see through, preventing people from prying inside. The bus's frame was made from highly durable metal alloys that could withstand the full power of several less than B greater than ranked villains. It was highly secured and was specifically made for protecting students from sudden ambushes from either villains or beasts. Looking behind the bus, 15 more buses lined up in the distance. Next to them, a crowd of students similar to us were all waiting to enter their respective buses. Because the number of people in the first years was well over 2,000, the students were each divided into different classes. My class was class A25. Each class had its own instructor, and the selection was random. That was if we exclude Jin, Emma, Amanda, Kevin, and Melissa who each could select which class they could be in. The privilege of the talented. 
Entering the bus, I looked left and right, and after spotting my group I made my way towards them. Along the way, I couldn't help but marvel at the interior of the bus. The seatings which reminded me of first-class seats on planes were made of fine leather. The seats were separated into two rows with two seats on each side. In front of each seat, there was a nice oak table that had several snacks on top. Arriving where my group was, a complicated look appeared on my face. According to what Donna had briefed us beforehand, we had to sit with our group during the whole bus ride which would take approximately five hours. This was so that we could get to know each other better. However, looking at my group, I started to doubt whether this was a good idea. On my right side, Evan and Cassandra were sitting together munching down some chips. Behind them, Melissa was quietly sitting on her seat with her eyes closed. Her whole aura screamed, don't disturb me. On the right side, Donald was sitting next to the window. He was currently busy staring at the scenery outside the window and thus seemed to have not realized that I had just arrived. Looking around, apart from the seats next to Melissa and Donald, everywhere else was full. As my eyes alternated between Melissa and Donald for a couple of seconds, I decided to sit next to Donald. Though I disliked the guy, I at least didn't risk the possibility of dying. Hum. What are you doing you bastard? Just as I was about to sit next to Donald, he turned around and glared at me. Ere I am sitting, pausing for a moment, I looked at Donald for a bit before ignoring him and seating on the seat. As soon as I sat on the seat, a moan almost escaped from my mouth. It felt as if I was inside of a cloud made of cotton. My back instantly sank into the chair, and the leather coating around the chair which preserved some of the cold from the previous night instantly cooled my body. Dot dot dot. Too comfortable. Just as I was enjoying my experience, I heard a loud voice on the right side of my ear. Turning my head to the side, I was met with the sight of Donald shouting at me. You rude bastard. Who gave you permission to sit next to me? Frowning, I was about to retort to him, but after thinking for a bit I refrained myself from doing so and decided to ignore him. I wasn't going to gain anything from arguing with him. Are you even listening to me, you rude bastard? How dare the likes of you IGN? At first, I was able to ignore him without any problems, however, after a couple of minutes of continuous verbal abuse, I couldn't take it anymore and snapped. Who you calling a bastard you bastard? My name is Ren. Ren Dover, not, rude bastard. Flipping the middle finger at his face I raised my voice. Leave me alone damn it, I am trying to enjoy this seat, so stop shouting like a parrot and let me have my peace. You son of a, opening his eyes wide, Donald was just about to retort back but before he could do that he heard a cold voice coming from the left side of the bus. Stop. Opening her eyes, Melissa took her glasses off and glared at both me and Donald. Cease your immature display at once, pointing behind her, where the other students were seated, she said. Are you planning on killing me from embarrassment? Was this something you had planned beforehand in order to kill me? If so you succeeded. I would rather drown myself in a bowl of water than being subjected to any more of this. Looking at where Melissa pointed, I soon noticed almost everyone on the bus staring in our direction. Coom. Coom, sorry everyone. Awkwardly coughing a couple of times, I apologized to everyone. It seems like Donald and I were a bit too loud. Without needing to be told by Melissa, we sat on our seats and stopped talking. Closing my eyes I decided to take a quick nap. Turning on my M3, I immediately plugged in my earphones and played a random song. Seeing both me and Donald sitting quietly like obedient children, Melissa's brows finally relaxed. Soon after, she closed her eyelids and prepared to sleep. However right after she closed her eyes, she said. You better be quiet while I'm sleeping, because. Okay. If you as much as speak another word, I'll make sure you drink my newly created potion that can send you straight to heaven. Looking at each other, both me and Donald felt a cold chill. We immediately shut up and decided to never utter a single word throughout the whole bus ride. Vroom. Soon the bus engine roared loudly and slowly the bus picked up its speed. Staring at the constantly changing scenery from outside the window, I took a deep breath and prepared myself for the upcoming trip. After the first cataclysm, the world map completely changed. The whole world became one mass of land in the map that we previously were accustomed to completely change. Then, the second cataclysm happened and humanity lost six-eighths of their land. Countries that somehow managed to survive the first cataclysm ceased to exist, and what replaced them was a new centralized government called the Central Government. Despite the fact that countries no longer existed, people couldn't forget their roots. Halberg. A city founded in 2015, by then S-ranked hero Ludwig Hallberg, a German citizen prior to the first cataclysm. The intent behind the creation of Hallberg was to recreate Germany. Ludwig Hallberg firmly believed that one should never forget one's roots, and thus from then on, Hallberg was considered the new Germany. Many people of German descent migrated to Hallberg and settled there in hopes of developing the city further. The culture, the language, the people, everything was exactly how it was back in Germany prior to the first cataclysm. Following the example set by Hallberg, many countries did the same and established cities that were based on their country of origin. The central government did not stop them nor did it try to stop them. They had too many problems to take care of to care about such insignificant matters. Alright guys, 
We will be arriving in Halberg in about ten minutes so get prepared. Waking me up, was Donna's crisp and pleasant voice which traveled through the bus speaker. Who am? Yawning loudly, I stretched my body. Looking around, I could see Donald and the rest waking up. Behind them, several students were already awake playing on their phones or talking to each other. Rubbing my eyes a couple of times, I rested my head on the headrest of the seat. To be honest, though I was comfortable throughout the whole trip, I would have preferred if we traveled through dimensional gates. Sitting for five hours without being active wasn't something I was used to now that I pretty much spent most of my time training. If it were before I reincarnated, I would have had no qualms with it. However, now that I have completely changed my routine, I couldn't stand not doing any physical activity for more than five hours unless it was for sleeping. Sadly, because the academy deemed gates too dangerous we couldn't use them. Because dimensional gates were still a new technology not much was known regarding their safety. Though tests have shown that it was safe to use dimensional gates, there have been a couple of incidents regarding them causing the whole government to still block them from being commercially available. Trains were also a no-go since they couldn't carry certain equipment that the instructors had prepared beforehand, and thus in the end the only option we had was to go by bus. Stand up, hum. Snapping me out of my thoughts was Donald who stood up and was waiting for me to leave my seat. Standing up, I followed the line of students heading towards the exit of the bus. As soon as I exited the bus, the light coming from the sun momentarily blinded my eyes. A wave of fresh air swept all over me instantly refreshing my whole body. Covering my face with my arm I looked around. Quote dot dot dot. How nice. Before me was a large expansive greenfield. Several houses built using timber framing and stone appeared on the greenfield, along with several cows that roamed around the field. In the far distance, an enormous building with thick metal walls covering its perimeter could be seen. Beyond the walls, were several large buildings that released smoke in the air, polluting the clean environment. After making sure that no one was missing, Donna who seemed to be in a better mood than before spoke. All right, everyone. Though we are in Hallberg, we are only in the outskirts. That is because before going into the city we will be making a trip towards the monster processing factory. We will first do a tour of the place, and then shortly after you will go with your group and complete your assigned task. Pausing and making sure that everyone understood what she meant, Donna turned around and made her way toward the large industrial building. All right follow me, chapter 56, thank you for coming. At the reception of the monster processing plant, greeting us was a blonde young girl with deep blue eyes. Her hair was tied in a bun, and she wore a gray suit that fitted around her body nicely. Thank you for having us, shaking her hand, Donna greeted the young lady with a smile. After sharing a couple of pleasantries with Donna, the young lady turned around and urged everyone to follow her. Please follow me. Heeding her words, we formed a long single line and followed her. Fortunately, because the other classes went to different facilities, it was not too crowded. A lot of procedures are taken into consideration when dismantling and processing monster and beast corpses. This plant right here is called Grunwies and we are responsible for dismantling less than G greater than to less than C greater than rank monster, beast corpses. As most of you know, the stronger the monster or beast, the harder it is to process. This is simply because their skins and bones become that much harder to remove and cut. Not only is their skin tougher, but they also tended to have poisonous properties that could instantly kill everyone present in the room. Therefore, we currently only have a license to process monsters and beasts between less than G greater than and less than C greater than rank. For higher ranked beasts and monsters, a special facility with top-notch equipment would be required. Along the way, the young lady started describing the features of the plant and what they did. She did briefly talk about the history of the plant, but all that information went from one ear to the other. I honestly did not care about the history of this place. Stopping right before the door that led to the main processing plant, the young lady turned around and said. Before we enter, I would like for all of you to get changed into adequate clothing. Following that, she signaled for a couple of individuals to enter. Arriving before us students were five individuals all wearing white lab coats, glasses, and masks. As they came, they pushed a trolley hanger that was filled with lab coats. Walking next to the hanger, the young lady looked at us and said. As I briefly mentioned before, in here we handle highly toxic and poisonous materials. For your safety and the general public safety, we need you all to be wearing lab coats. If we don't take this precaution, we could potentially endanger people or even habitats, as some of the stuff here can be extremely lethal. As she continued rambling on how important it was to wear adequate safety equipment, I looked around the place. Though we were not yet at the main processing facility, surrounding us were a lot of monster, dolls, that had been stuffed with preserving materials allowing them to keep their original appearance. Because they were so well preserved, it looked like the real thing was here making it that much more intriguing to look at. They had a wide display of monsters and beast dolls, and they each had a tag at the bottom briefly describing what type of monster they were. It was sort of like a mini museum. All right, now get changed and come back here within 10 minutes. Finished with what she wanted to say, the young lady signaled for the five guys to distribute the coat. Lining up and taking the suit, I immediately went to the changing room to get dressed. 
After completely changing and wearing my mask and glasses I headed back to the meeting place. Along the way, I noticed a lot of students looking around at the monster dolls around the place. I too was curious, and thus decided to look at the one closest to the meeting place. Pausing in front of a beast that resembled an inconspicuous looking crow, I looked at its description. Less than C greater than black feathered crow. Black feathered crow, also known as night reapers, are extremely dangerous beasts that are an evolved version of a crow. They are extremely cunning and can be extremely deceiving from their outer appearance, which looks like any regular crow, making them extremely hard to fight against. Due to their unparalleled speed, they are unmatched in the air and almost unstoppable if they decide to dive down to hunt their prey. Their beaks which are as hard as titanium yet less dense than it, are extremely sought after in TSS. Now, this was a beast I didn't want to encounter. Alright, since everyone is ready let's go. Exactly 10 minutes after the young lady dismissed us, wearing a lab coat and glasses she appeared before everyone and led us to the main door that led to the processing facility. Clank. Opening the large metal door that led to the processing plant, I instantly felt a pungent smell invade my nostrils. My glasses clogged up, and the hot and humid environment made me want to leave the place immediately. Next to me, several people showed similar reactions to me as they all frowned and made weird faces. Clank. 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 Taking a look at the facility, the first thing I saw was robotic arms that roamed around the facility freely. They were either cutting down monster and beast carcasses that were laying down on large metallic tables or were carrying them to different places. Operating the machines were several individuals all wearing lab coats and glasses. They each alternated using the machines, and if one looked carefully, they could see a glow emanating from their body indicating that they were using mana to use the machinery. This was a familiar scene everywhere, as not so far from them, several individuals were operating similar machines on a different monster or beast. As you can see, this is how we process monsters, smiling at everyone, the young lady led us to one of the areas in which a monster was being processed. Stopping, she looked at everyone and pointed towards one of the processing tables. This beast right here is a steel-plated rhino, and just like its name may suggest, it has a very tough outer layer. Looking in the direction where the young lady was pointing it, a large beast that was 5 meters in length lifelessly lay down on a large metallic table. The beast's body was humongous and looked to be extremely muscular judging from the size of its legs. It had a huge horn on the top of its nose, and despite it being closely related to a rhino, the steel-plated rhino looked much more fearsome. They were incomparable. Around the body of the steel-plated rhino, metallic arms that shot thin laser beams continuously worked on dismantling the outer layer of the beast. Taken noticed the student's interest in the lasers, the young lady quickly explained to them. What we are using is a highly powerful laser that shoots a single beam of 12 petawatts of energy that lasts 5 seconds per shot. Thanks to how advanced technology has become, we are now able to use laser technology to directly cut extremely tough and durable materials such as monster parts and even diamonds. Because of how tough the outer layer of a steel-plated rhino is, we can only resort to using lasers to remove its skin. Pointing at the laser machine she continued, the cylinder that is used to shoot the laser is made of titanium doped sapphire that can perfectly withstand the power coming from the laser. If not for the fact that anything beyond it would be class. Whilst she was speaking, I made sure to note down everything she said. This information was extremely useful for my tasks. Looking around, it seems like I wasn't the only one with this idea as almost everyone was taking notes of what the young lady was saying. Over here is where we sort and store the different types of materials that we remove from the beast's body. Once we manage to remove their skin, we will leave it out to dry and rest for at least 24 hours before bleaching it with a relatively strong acid. Arriving in front of a large warehouse, lots of monster skin and bones were neatly sorted into different piles with labels on them. Next to them were large circular white buckets containing a transparent liquid. Every minute, a worker wearing rubber gloves would soak the monster's skin for a good minute before hanging it and letting it dry in the air. Seeing the confusion on everyone's faces, the young lady smiled and explained. The bleaching process is extremely important as guilds love to use these materials for their suits and hence like to customize them. Pausing slightly, she winked at everyone and said, there's a reason why there are different designs for armors and equipment. Hearing her joking remark, everyone lightly chuckled. What she said was true. People love to wear specially designed suits when entering dungeons. Part of it was due to having an extra layer of protection, but the main reason was its design. It was sort of like wearing clothes. When I roamed Ashton City in my free time, I noticed many shops with different suit designs. Most notably, I remember seeing a suit in full pink which pretty much screamed, I am here, it was so over the top that I wouldn't be surprised if all the monsters decided to attack the person wearing the suit. They were like a walking target. Well, who was I to judge right? Just like that, we followed her around the facility as she explained different things. Sometimes some students would ask questions and she would promptly respond to them, but most of the time she was recounting useless information. From time to time, however, she would talk about the things that I needed for my assignment, if she did do so, I would immediately take note of it. However, two hours into the tour, I started to get extremely bored. She started rambling on which monsters were selected, 
who was in charge of making decisions, and other useless nonsense that I honestly couldn't care less about. Moreover, the hot and humid environment caused me to be extremely uncomfortable. It was to the point that I was starting to feel extremely lethargic. Finally, after who knew how long, the young lady stopped and said. All right, I think I've said enough for today. Thank you very much for coming. I wasn't the only one who was rejoining about the fact that the tour had ended as pretty much everyone around me looked re-energized. Thank you very much for this experience. Thanking the young lady, Donna looked at her watch and said. All right, we will take a 10-minute break before going back to the hotel to rest for the day. Taking off her mask and glasses, Donna threw them in a nearby bin and proceeded to say. Meet me where the bus previously dropped us in 10 minutes time. If you need to go to the bathroom or stretch, make sure you take care of it now as the ride to the hotel will take approximately 20 minutes. That is if there is no traffic which I honestly doubt. After saying her piece, Donna left in the direction of where the bus was. Hey bastard, did you take note of everything? Just as I was about to follow Donna back, I heard an annoying voice coming from behind me. Turning around, I could see Donald making his way towards me. How many times did I tell you that my name is Ren and not Bastard? I don't care, did you take notes or not? Rolling me eyes at him I responded. Yes, I did good, after you settle in your room meet me later so that we can get this thing over with. As soon as he finished what he wanted to say, Donald left. As he was leaving, a weird look appeared on my face as I couldn't help but say. Oh? Surprisingly you're the serious type, without turning around, Donald irritably responded. Shut it scrub, unlike you, I'd like to keep my ranking. Yes, yes, shaking my head I followed him back to the bus. Somehow, people cared too much about their ranking. Well it was understandable as it dictated which guild they could join in the future, but it somehow seems to be like some kind of obsession here. Looking at the blue sky that was turning dark, I lightly murmured. Well, it's not like I don't care either, I too wanted to climb up the ranking, but even if I wanted to, I'd have to do it slowly and unnoticeably, else people would think I was hiding some sort of secret. Sigh. Letting out a sigh, I entered the bus and sat next to Donald like I had done previously. Maybe I'll increase my ranking in my midterms, who knows. Chapter 57. The sun had already started to set, leaving behind an orange veil of light that enveloped the sky. Hallberg city lights brightly lit the surroundings, and despite it being a relatively large city, skyscrapers appeared to be scarce. Most houses consisted of five stories apartments or villas, and only occasionally would there be a skyscraper in the distance. Stopping in front of a large mansion that looked to be the size of a football stadium, we quickly left the bus and headed toward the place. As I left the bus, the first thing I did was stretch my back and legs. I was honestly exhausted. Despite the fact that I hadn't trained at all today, my mind could barely function properly as everything around me became sort of hazy. I guess using my brain was just as tiring as using my body. Well that wasn't the only reason I was tired. Recently I had only been getting on average 6 hours of sleep a day, which wasn't too bad if it was for a couple of days. Dot, but this had been a recurring thing for the past week or so. Seeing how sleepy I was getting, I knew that the accumulated fatigue I had built up this past week had started crashing on me. Shaking my head quickly, I looked around to find ways to take my mind off of sleeping. Dot, dot, dot. I only needed to wait for a further 5 to 10 minutes before being able to get some good shut eye. As I was trying to keep myself awake, my eyes landed on the other side of the parking area where our bus parked. Not so far from us, there were already five similar-looking buses parked near the mansion indicating that some of the other classes had already arrived. Seeing that we weren't the last ones here, I felt my mind clear a bit. It seems like we finished at just the right time. Since there were more groups coming, it meant that I had more time to rest. This was good as I really needed to take a power nap. Alright, let's get going, after talking to the driver of the bus for a bit, Donna waved goodbye to him and led us to the mansion. Entering the mansion, a nice fragrance invaded my nostrils causing me to uncontrollably salivate. Looking around, it seemed like I was not the only one who felt that way as most people were staring in the direction of where the nice aroma was coming from. Turning around, Donna who seemed to have read what was on the mind of most people started speaking. Alright everyone, I know you guys are hungry, but things need to be done in order. Taking out a card from her pocket, she pointed towards the reception and said. First things first, I will call you each by your name and you will then proceed to go to reception and collect your card. After that, you will come back here and wait for the others to finish before heading to your own designated room. Seeing everyone's deflated looks, Donna lightly smiled and raised her brow. Don't be so down, don't tell me you guys are planning on eating when you had just sweated for a whole day? Checking her watch quickly, she added, at 8 on the dot, as you guys can already tell by the smell, there will be a buffet where everyone can eat and drink as much as they want, so hurry up and get changed. Holding my stomach that had started rumbling ever since I had caught a whiff of the nice fragrance, I quickly collected my room key and made my way towards my room. Along the way, I couldn't help but admire the luxurious place. The insides of the building were decorated with exquisite paintings and statues. Covering the floor was a nice red carpet that felt extremely soft to the touch. 
Next to the windows were red curtains that had a lighter pigmentation compared to the carpet, giving it a sharp and pleasing contrast. At the hem of the curtains, there were finely decorated golden patterns that depicted flying dragons. The best part of the mansion was the outside, as I could see a massive garden where its splendor was further emphasized by the lanterns outside that shone down on it. Next to the garden, I could see a tennis court and a football field that were both enclosed by green fences. Shaking my head, I couldn't help but wonder how much this place had cost. Considering how well it was decorated and how big this place was, I'd say it cost well over a 100 million U. Click. After navigating the long corridors, I arrived at my apartment and opened the door. Prior to coming to the room, when I was collecting my keys, I had been made aware by the receptionist that I would be given a regular room that consisted of one living room, one bathroom, and one bedroom. Yeah, she said regular. Though the decorations weren't as luxurious as the ones outside, it was still within the scope of luxurious, as paintings and other expensive decorations were placed in the room. Because I placed most of my stuff inside of my bracelet, I didn't need to drop off anything. Therefore, I decided to take a quick shower to remove all of the sweat that had accumulated on my body. Pomp. After taking a quick shower, I slumped on the large bed in my room and closed my eyes. I needed to sort my thoughts which had been a mess since the start of the trip. Five days. That's how long I had before the big event was going to happen. Looking at the white ceiling where a gold-plated chandelier brightly lit the room, I covered my eyes with my arm and murmured. Should I interfere or not? A big massacre was going to happen in five days' time, as about one quarter of all first years would be murdered. The tragedy of Hallberg. was what this event was called. Closing my eyes and taking a deep breath I was deeply conflicted. Despite the fact that I knew that I shouldn't interfere, a small part of me wanted to change the outcome of what was to happen. One of the reasons why I never liked to interact with people wasn't just because I was an introvert. No it's because, by the middle stages of the novels, chances were that all the friends I had made would end up dying. If there was a thing I had learned since dying and transmigration into this world was that life was fickle. Every second, there was a chance you could die. No one was safe from death, especially for extras whose sole role was to either die or be forgotten in the later stages of the novel. The less I got attached to this academy, the more I could firm my will and stop myself from doing anything stupid. Dot but still. The fact that I could prevent the death of a lot of students weighed heavily on me. Those lost lives are on me. Looking at my hands, I slightly clenched them into fists. Images of my hands becoming dyed in blood replayed in my mind as my eyes shook slightly. They too had dreams and aspirations to have a family and become heroes that protect humanity. Heroes. Dot huh, repeating that word in my mind, I scoffed. How laughable. Despite the fact that society labeled individuals that wielded power as heroes, they were nothing of the sort. In this world, hero, was merely a label that the government had stuck on individuals that wielded power to give hope to society. A symbol was what they were called. They were beings meant to be idolized and worshipped, as they were responsible for protecting humanity from the likes of demons and villains. Dot dot dot. Sadly, reality proved to be different as in this corrupt world most heroes were a bunch of hypocrites that were no better than villains. They valued human life as nothing more than a fleeting thing that could be crushed by their own will and power. Take a look at Michael Parker. An esteemed less than s greater than ranked hero and 47th on the hero ranking. He who was deemed to be a hero, was now planning on massacring a bunch of 16 year olds. In the end who were the real villains? Don't get me wrong, there were some great heroes out there that actually cared about saving the world, but those were in the minority, as most heroes tended to somehow crave more power as soon as they got a taste of fame and money. In the end, only people like Kevin who had a hero complex and loved helping people out could be properly defined by the word, hero. Me? Shaking my head, I couldn't help but laugh despite the fact that I knew very soon most people around me will die, I wasn't doing anything to prevent that. If I were a hero, I would have immediately helped everyone and saved as many lives as possible. Sadly I wasn't that type of person. I wasn't selfless enough to help anyone I could see at the expense of myself. Though, the fact that my decision would lead to a lot of deaths has weighed down on me heavily this past week. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night soaked in sweat. In my dreams, the corpses of the countless students who I could have saved continuously appeared blaming me for their death. Since coming here, I knew this would have happened. I had braced myself for this. I had braced myself for the mental conflicts that my mind would continuously have the longer I stayed in this world. Many deaths will be on me, and I acknowledge this. Selfish. That's how I would describe myself. Dot dot dot. I only cared for what was within my reach and not for what was a little bit further away. It almost felt as I had erected a tall wall around me that prevented people from approaching me. I joke around a lot here and there. I try to keep the mood around me lighthearted, but that was all a mask. Deep inside me, continuous conflicts were constantly brewing. Should I do this, should I do that, what was right and what was wrong? Should I act this way or should I act that way? Every day these thoughts would constantly haunt me. I knew that if things kept going like this that maybe one day I would make a decision that would completely change who I was, I knew it yet. 
Closing my eyes, I looked away from the blinding light coming from the chandelier. Looking outside the window, at the star-filled sky, I thought. Maybe transmigrating here was just as much of a blessing as it was a curse. Dot dot dot. Not so far from Ren, similarly staring at the beautiful star-filled sky, a stunningly beautiful young girl with short auburn hair was lost in her own thoughts. Today had been a hectic day, and if not for the fact that there was a large buffet awaiting her, Emma would have loved for nothing more but to slump on her bed and sleep. The bed was tempting. Dot but she knew. She knew that once she laid on that bed, there was no coming back. Feeling the cool breeze of the night, Emma's mind wandered to a troubling piece of news she had received from one of her dad's subordinates. The message stated, Parkers have ceased their hostile takeovers over Rochefield-owned businesses, and seem to have gone radio silent. Normally, she should have rejoiced at the news that the Parkers had stopped going after her family assets, but Emma felt uneasy about their actions. The overbearing Parker conglomerate suddenly yielded in a financial battle. Please, there was no way Emma would believe that. Emma had this gut feeling that the Parkers were planning something. Something big. Something that would cause them to have an edge over her family. Their sudden action of ceasing whatever they were doing was almost like they were foreshadowing that this was merely the calm before the storm. Staring at the crescent moon in the sky, Emma sighed and headed back to her room. I hope I'm wrong. Chapter 58. Are you guys headed down as well? Exiting her room, Emma caught sight of two girls quietly walking down the corridor. Because the lighting was good, the features of the two girls became more apparent. Both of them had flawless white skin that was devoid of any imperfections. Their hair, which were black and brown respectively, gently cascaded on their back, stopping right before their waist. On the left, Amanda wore tight black pants along with a white turtle neck sweater that covered part of her neck. Melissa on the other hand wore a simple brown cardigan, a plain white shirt, and some jeans. As they walked, Amanda's cold demeanor contrasted perfectly with Melissa's arrogant and overbearing one creating this picture-like scene. It was like seeing a pair of phoenixes. Jogging to catch up to them, Emma brushed her hair to the side and stopped right when she was about an arm's length away from them. Pouting slightly, Emma sourly looked at Amanda and Melissa before saying. Hey come on, why didn't you guys stop and waited for me? Looking at Emma from the corner of her eyes, Melissa responded. Would it have made a difference? Turning her head towards Melissa, Emma looked at her sharply before saying. What? No, but it's still common courtesy to wait for your friend. Sure. Whatever makes you feel better. Ah, uh, seriously what am I gonna do with you? Shaking her head at Melissa's lackluster response, Emma looked at Amanda who remained quiet the whole time. Avoiding Emma's eyes, Amanda looked around the corridor. It was apparent that she didn't want to talk. Rolling her eyes, Emma facepalmed. What am I gonna do with you guys? Though they had known each other for about two months, the distance between them didn't shrink at all during the time they had spent together. No matter how much she tried to socialize and interact with them, they would always keep her at arm's length away. This was especially so for Amanda, who was always curt and polite, treating everyone as if they were a stranger. In the end, Emma was left totally helpless when interacting with these two. Letting out a sigh, Emma thought for a bit before saying. Dot say, don't you guys find Jin a bit weird these days? As soon as the word, Jayan escaped from Emma's mouth, Melissa's face darkened. Don't even mention the name of that guy. Halfway through her sentence, Melissa held her stomach and continued. Crap, I'm already starting to lose my appetite thinking about him. No, seriously, he feels a bit off these days. Though Emma knew that Melissa was constantly tormented by Jin on a daily basis, she also knew that if there was someone who would notice his strange behavior it was her. That was simply because he would always try to talk to her whenever he had free time. It had gotten to the point that Melissa purposely decided to return back to the dorm at a later hour than usual. This was so that she could avoid him. Before Melissa could answer, Amanda who had been quiet the whole time responded. He has become a lot quieter than he was before. Turning her head to Amanda, Emma nodded and said. You also think so as well. Hearing the conversation between Emma and Amanda, Melissa thought for a bit before saying. Maybe you're right, I did notice him pestering me less than before. Dot but whatever happened to him, I am all in for it. Despite Jin being obvious with his advances, Melissa had more than once shut him down completely. She simply did not care about having any romantic interactions, as the only thing on her mind was her research. She was very close to breaking through into a particular theorem that had plagued her for a couple of years, it had almost become an obsession for her. Therefore, dot for Melissa, who was in this critical juncture of proving her theorem, Jin's constant pestering had caused her nothing but headaches. If someone were to ask her who was the most annoying person in the academy, for her, Jin was undoubtedly number one. He's pestering you less, hum, so meth. Halfway through her sentence, Emma was stopped by Melissa who couldn't help but say. Let's not talk about him anymore. It's spoiling my appetite. Without waiting for Emma to respond, Melissa picked up her pace and headed towards the first floor where the banquet was held. Turning her head to the side and seeing Amanda also being uninterested in the topic, Emma lightly sighed and said. Okay. Dot dot dot. After calming down a bit, 
I decided to head downstairs where the banquet was held. In the end, hunger got the best of me. As I was heading downstairs, I soon noticed the figure of a student walking ahead of me. Squinting my eyes to get a better look at who it was, I was surprised by my discovery. Rank 5. Han Yufei, also known as Frank Han, and the leader of Class A-23. From the back, I could see his short black hair that was permed in a way that looked like he had a mop on his head. His body was on the relatively skinnier side, and he wore round glasses. Though he didn't look particularly strong, his presence alone screamed, danger, to me. It felt as if I was staring at a crouching tiger waiting to lunge at me at any moment. I guess he wasn't ranked fifth for no reason. Apart from knowing that he was ranked fifth, I actually didn't know that much else about him. I didn't develop his character much, but from what I remember, he was an easygoing guy with no ulterior motives. Most surprisingly was the fact that he didn't care about other people's ranking, as most of the people he hung out with were lower rank than him. Some even by a margin that was as large as mine. He was of Chinese descent, and his martial arts were on another level. He was probably the only person in the academy that did not use any weapons when fighting. He only fought with his body. He was what was known as a full-body martial artist, someone who fought with every part of his body. He comes from the Han clan, one of the three main ancient Chinese clans that resided in Ashton City. The three ancient Chinese clans were Wang, Shan, and Han clan respectively. The martial manual he practices was actually a five-star martial manual, and it was passed to him by the patriarch of the clan. Despite his strength, in my novel he didn't get that much character development. He only showed up on rare occasions, and those times were when he was either in the academy or when Kevin needed his help. Looking back at it now, such a strong character should have definitely had more time in the story. Well, no use in regretting what was already done. Following Frank, I quickly headed towards where the banquet was being held. Soon I could hear the sound of a lot of people laughing and chatting. The closer I got, the louder the sounds became. Turning left, I soon found myself inside an enormous hall. Looking up, three enormous chandeliers brightly lit the hall. Massive pillars made out of marble supported the structure of the room, and next to them, tables filled with food could be seen all over the place. Waiters dressed in black outfits wandered around the place as they served different drinks. Despite it not being 8 o'clock, the hall was already filled to the brim with students. Looking around, I soon spotted the area where my class was. Making my way there, I took a drink from the waiter and slowly savored it. Aw oh, damn it, I forgot that alcohol doesn't affect me anymore. After tasting the drink and realizing that it had no effect on me, I slightly cursed and downed the whole thing in one go. What was the point of alcohol if you couldn't get drunk from it? Shaking my head, I soon arrived at the area where my group was designated to. Looking left and right, I quickly spotted Donald and my other group members and headed to where they were. Eu, lightly waving, I stood next to them. Looking at me who had just come, Donald gave me a side glance and then proceeded to ignore me. Rolling my eyes at him, stared at the front, it seems like everyone has arrived. Five minutes after my arrival, Donna showed up. Immediately, all of the boys' attention was drawn towards her. Wearing a one-piece black dress with fine silver patterns, Donna looked stunning. Her dress, which was moderately tight, further emphasized her well-developed outline. Moreover, her violet necklace that perfectly matched the color of her eyes, made Donna look ever more mesmerizing. Next to me, I could hear the hurried breathing of some of the male students as they looked at her with heart in their eyes. Closing my eyes, I calmed my heart down. Usually, I would have been like any of the other male students here, but today, today, I had too much on my mind. I just couldn't bring myself to admire her beauty. Not bothered by everyone's stares, Donna's violet eyes paused on everyone. Looking around and seeing that everyone was here she continued. There are two reasons as to why I've gathered all of you here. One is to obviously eat some food and satiate our hunger and regain some of the energy that we have burnt during our visit. Looking to her right, Donna pointed in the direction of where the food was. Sadly, since we are the last class, we can only wait for the others to eat first. Dot but before that. Pausing slightly, Donna's mood became a bit more serious as she deeply looked at a few individuals. The second reason, it's because we will soon give you all an individual assignment. Instantly murmurs could be heard from everyone as they wondered what task they would be given. Judging from how she said the word, individual, it seems like this task could only be completed without anyone else's aid. I will soon give you the task which you have been assigned. Each of you has been given three days' time to complete the task. Dot and failing to complete the task means automatic credit deduction from your end-of-year report. As she was speaking, Donna could see some of the students shaking in nervousness. Shaking her head lightly she added. Don't worry, the difficulty of your tasks has been assigned according to your abilities. After a lot of consideration, we managed to assign you guys tasks that are well within the reported data of your strength. Therefore, you guys should be relatively safe. Clap clapping her hand to get the attention of some of the students that had stopped listening and were trying to find out what their task was, Donna smiled and said. All right, I think I've said enough. I will soon send you your tasks on your phone. 
Please enjoy the food and make sure you don't fail the missions. Ding. Right on cue, a message appeared on my phone. Just as I was about to open it and see what my task was, Donna spoke once again. Ah. I forgot to add. We won't aid you in your task, so if you guys die, you die. We won't be helping you. Instantly, the room became tense. Some students started shaking in nervousness as they carefully looked at their phones to see what their task was. Well, sorry to have dampened the mood for you all, but I felt that I needed to warn you beforehand so that you don't get complacent thinking that we will save your asses even if you were to fail the mission. Finished with what she wanted to say, Donna quickly left and joined the other instructors who had similarly shared the news with the other students. Turning on my phone, I looked at the notification that had popped up on my screen. Student rank 1750, Ren Dover, mission target, Carl Zar. Head of a minor drug organization that had infiltrated Halberg for the past decade. Target location at XXXXXX Road. Target behavioral pattern. Taking a deep breath, I looked at the ceiling of the hall. I guess I'll have to prepare myself. Chapter 59. Inside a large dark room, the figure of an extremely handsome individual could be seen sitting crossed leg in the middle of the bed. TSSSSSSSS, sitting shirtless on the bed, steam slowly rose from the figure's body. As steam poured out from his body, the figure suddenly tensed and relaxed his muscles repeatedly. He continued doing so for every five seconds time intervals. As he tensed his muscles, the outline of his veins that traced all over his body became more apparent making him look extremely scary. Foo. After a couple of minutes of continuous tensing and relaxing, the figure suddenly released a long breath and finally opened his eyes, revealing two scarlet red eyes. Standing up and taking a towel from a nearby table, Kevin dried his wet body. Turning around, he looked at his reflection in the mirror. His body, which was chiseled to perfection had multiple scar wounds on both his abdomen and chest areas. His back was even worse, as it was riddled with scars that ranged from different sizes and shapes. Most notably, there was one that stretched halfway through his back. Tracing one of the scars that appeared on his chest, Kevin was reminded of the time where he was forced to fight against multiple less than G greater than ranked villains when he had just entered less than F greater than rank. It was a mission that the system had given him in exchange for a relatively powerful skill. In the end, if not for the fact that he had multiple trump cards on him, he would have long have died that day. All the scars on his body were reminders of the hardship he had gone through to get to where he was. Throwing the towel on the bed, Kevin opened his phone and checked his most recent notification. Student rank 1, Kevin Boss, mission target, Victor Hugh, Halberg Minister of Finances. Charged with corruption and embezzlement. Target location at X Road. Target behavioral pattern. Corrupt officer Hu, looking through the data file sent to him, Kevin quickly skimmed through the contents. Stopping on a certain section, Kevin frowned, embezzlement, money laundering, soliciting and acting as an intermediary for drug trades, false imprisonment of government officials, sexual harassment. The more he looked through the series of crimes his target was accused of, the deeper Kevin's frown became. Such trash, turning his phone off, Kevin placed it in his pocket. Click. Dressing up in a simple white t-shirt and black pants, Kevin took his black cashmere jacket and headed out of the room. Ding. Host has received a new mission, would you like to view it? Not surprised by the sudden notification, Kevin nodded. Yes, open quest interface. Equals 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 system quest equals equals equals. Difficulty rank. E plus. Mission. Eliminate Victor Hugh, a corrupt minister that has been embezzling funds from Halberg. Guarded by several less than F greater than ranked individuals and one less than E greater than ranked guard. Mission reward. Rank upgrade. E plus play button D. Looking at the quest window that popped in front of him, Kevin frowned as soon as he saw the difficulty of the mission. However, that frown soon relaxed. Opening his status window, he looked through his stats. Equals 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 status equals 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 name. Kevin Voss rank. E plus strength. D. Agility. E plus. Stamina. E. Intelligence. E plus. Mana capacity. E. Luck. E charm. D plus to profession. Swordsmanship LVL.4. To martial manual. Everlasting Sunset, Greater Realm of Mastery. Sword art primarily focused on creating feints and hiding true sword intent. By creating multiple illusions of sword art, the enemy will find it harder to defend as the true attack will always be masked under multiple feints. Sky Steps. Minor Realm of Mastery movement art that considerably increases user agility. Upon reaching a certain level of mastery, stepping on the air is possible. Greater than skills. E. Overdrive. A skill that enables user to push bodily functions to the extreme. For one minute, the user can exhibit power that is double of original user strength. User will also find their other stats increasing considerably. After usage of skill, user will experience extreme fatigue making it hard for them to focus and carry out ordinary tasks for the next few hours. F. Mind cleansing. Increases user computational and analytical ability for a short period of time. Can't be used for a prolonged period of time due to the risk of possible brain trauma. F. Monocoding. 
a skill that enables user to replenish mana more quickly by expanding the pores on the human body. Equals 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 finally, after more than four months of being stuck at E plus rank, he finally had a chance to increase his rank. If not for the fact that he had enrolled in the lock, Kevin estimated that he would have already have reached less than D to rank. He had wasted a lot of time at the academy. The environment wasn't like before where he would constantly be on the edge, almost dying multiple times a week. Sometimes, the missions were so dangerous that even the slightest mistake could cost him his life. The environment in the lock was much more relaxed than his previous environment, which in a way was good as it allowed him to learn other things aside from fighting. Dot, but it had also stagnated his fighting ability. Only through constantly being on the edge of your life would you truly become strong. The more peaceful their environment was, the fewer chances for growth. That's what Kevin firmly believed. Dot, dot, dot. Stopping in front of the reception desk, Kevin walked up to a young female receptionist and asked. Hello, may I know if I can rent a bike? Looking up and seeing Kevin, the receptionist was momentarily stunned by his appearance. However, that didn't ask long as she quickly collected herself. A bike? Yes, preferably a black one that goes at incredibly high speeds. Hmm, let me speak with the manager. Knitting her brows, the receptionist picked up her phone and dialed a number. This was the first time that she had ever been asked to rent a bike, so she didn't know what do to. Hence why she opted to call for her manager. Hello. Picking up the phone, a middle-aged voice could be heard from the other side of the phone. Sir, a student is requesting to borrow a bike, a bike? Why would he want to borrow a bike? I don't know as well, that's why I'm asking for confirmation with you. Pausing slightly, the person on the other side of the phone said. Can you ask for the student's name? Covering the speaker of the phone, the young clerk lady looked at Kevin and asked. Can you please tell me your name? Nodding his head, Kevin replied. Kevin Voss, all right thank you. Dot sir his name is Kevin Voss I believe. Kevin Voss. Kevin. Ah. Repeating the name a couple of times, the person on the other side of the phone seemed to have had a sudden realization as his voice increased a few pitches. Boss? Realizing what he had done, the person on the other side of the phone awkwardly coughed and said. Coom, it was nothing. Hand him the keys to the Larvi 9027. Pausing for a second, the receptionist opened her eyes wide and said. Why you mean, the Larvi 9027? Her shocked reaction was understandable. It had to be noted that the Larvi 9027 was the most advanced bike they had in their mansion. A single one of those bikes costs upwards of a couple dozen million yu. She also remembers clearly that her boss highly favored that bike. Dot yet right now he wanted nothing more but to give it to a teenager. Yes, do it quick. You have my permission. Hearing the urgency of her boss's voice, the receptionist didn't dare refute and agreed. Okay, if that student asks for anything else, make sure you try to please him as much as you can. Overwhelmed by the huge favor the young boy before her was getting, the receptionist could only dumbly agree to her boss's orders. A big shot. The young boy before her was a big shot. Okay, all right, call me if anything happens regarding that student. Talk. Hanging up, the receptionist looked at Kevin with a complicated look. Please follow me, opening a small safe box, the receptionist took a pair of black keys and urged Kevin to follow her. Soon they entered an elevator that brought them to the bottom floor. Ding. As soon as the elevator doors opened, Kevin was stunned by what he saw. Rows upon rows of supercars appeared on the large floor. The large collection of cars were sorted by brand and age at which they were manufactured, with some of the cars dating as far back as 2015. Please follow me, without waiting for Kevin to admire the place, the receptionists moved towards where the bikes were parked and urged him to keep up. D. D. Stopping in front of a bike, the receptionist took out the keys and unlocked the bike. Quote dot dot dot. Here's the bike. Handing the keys to Kevin, the receptionist smiled at his reaction. It was that of awe. Looking at the bike in front of him, Kevin couldn't help but be amazed. As soon as the bike turned on, the body of the bike lifted upwards levitating right on top of its two thick wheels. The frame of the bike was matte black, and its long frame could accommodate two people comfortably. Thank you, satisfied, Kevin smiled and mounted the bike. Here, handing Kevin a nice black helmet that covered the whole face, the receptionist stepped back. Putting on the helmet, Kevin lightly nodded at the receptionist. Tightened the grip of the bike throttle, the bike silently sped into the distance. Watching Kevin leave, the receptionist smiled and said. Have a safe trip, Chapter 60 As night shrouded Hallberg, a silhouette sped into the busy streets of the city. Swiftly moving between cars, the figure of an individual could be seen riding on top of a slick motorbike that emitted no sound. If not for the two lights coming from the front of the bike, someone could have easily overlooked the bike that was swiftly moving in between the streets. After ten more minutes of riding, silently stopping in front of a large villa, Kevin took off his helmet revealing his two scarlet red eyes that shone under the moonlight. Shua. System open inventory, extending his hand to the right and retrieving it back, a drone appeared in his hand. Turning on the drone, Kevin turned on the cloaking function as well as the noise dampening function installed on the drone. 
Bees. Throwing the drone in the air, it silently disappeared and melted into the darkness of the night, completely blending with everything around it. Staring at where the drone used to be, Kevin blankly looked at the villa before him. This wasn't the first time Kevin assassinated someone. Multiple times the system had given him similar missions where he would have to kill highly ranked individuals. Therefore, as soon as he got assigned his mission, he already had all the necessary things needed to carry out the mission. Turning on his phone, Kevin spectated the drone's view of the mansion. Frowning slightly, Kevin turned on the holographic function of his phone. Soon a three-dimensional perspective of the villa became visible. Pinching his fingers, he carefully scrutinized the layout of the area. The villa was relatively large, and it consisted of one main building surrounded by large cement walls. Around the villa, there was a large garden, filled with all sorts of flowers and plants, and next to it was a large maze. In the middle of the maze, there was a nice wooden pavilion surrounded by red and pink roses. Controlling the drone, Kevin moved it around the perimeter of the gate where several men dressed in black could be seen patrolling the area. Counting all of the people he could spot patrolling the mansion, Kevin turned on the thermal imaging camera to make sure he didn't miss anyone due to the darkness of the night. 15, 16, 17. As he counted, he couldn't help but frown. This many people just outside? Something told Kevin that something wasn't right. Click. Thinking for a bit, Kevin decided to deploy his mini scouting devices. Pressing on a button on his screen, several small devices dropped from the drone, landing softly on the garden's grass. Swiping left, Kevin switched the view from the drone's point of view to the mini scouting device's view. As he navigated the mini scouting devices with his phone, Kevin kept the drone in the air to monitor the surroundings, just in case something happened. Quietly entering the villa, carefully controlling one of the small scouting devices, Kevin quietly looked through each room. After a couple of minutes of continuous scouting, Kevin stopped at what seemed to be his target's study room. Infiltrating the room through the small gap of the door, Kevin was able to see the inside of the room. In the middle of the room stood a large wooden desk with two white leather sofas positioned right in front of it. Behind the desk, there was a large window that overlooked the whole garden. A large carpet that seemed to have been made from real animal skin covered the whole floor, and around the room, multiple different paintings were displayed for people to see. Just as Kevin was about to check through the files on his target's desk, the scouting device picked up a few tremors coming from the ground. Frowning slightly, Kevin quickly hid the device from human view and turned on the cloaking function. Creak. Have all the preparations been made? Entering the room, a fat middle-aged man dressed in a red robe that had fine golden patterns looked behind him as he spoke. Accompanying him were several black-clothed individuals who were all warily looking in the same direction the fat middle-aged man was looking. Kevin who was watching from the scouting device instantly identified the fat middle-aged man. Victor Hugh, his assassination target. Matching the description of his target with the image displayed on his screen, Kevin confirmed that he was in fact, Victor. A few seconds after Victor entered the room, a towering man whose muscles were the size of a head entered the room. As he entered the room, his presence and Demonor completely overwhelmed everyone that was in the room. Only Victor remained relatively unfazed by the man's aura. Pamph. Slumping on his chair. Victor gestured for the towering man to sit on one of the sofas opposite to him. Sitting down, the tall man spoke, Mr. Oliver has already entered the premise and is currently in talks with Secretary Chun with regards to securing a new supply route. Within an hour we should be able to finalize a deal with them. Hearing the name Oliver being mentioned, Victor's face became dark. Oliver, the guy that monopolized most trading routes in Halberg. Nodding his head, the tall man confirmed, dot yes. Frowning slightly, Victor tapped his finger on the table and asked. Has the security around here been tightened? Nodding his head, the tall man said. Yes, we have hired a couple of extra guards. Though only two are decent, ranking at F rank. Holding his almost non-existent chin with one of his fingers, Victor remained silent for a bit before saying what had been bugging his mind for the past two days. Dot say, were there any unusual activities coming from the students that came from the lock? Lightly chuckling, the tall muscular man who seemed to have seen through Victor's worries spoke. Even if they did move, I would doubt a bunch greenies like them would be able to get past me. Forcing a smile, Victor shook his head, it's not that simple, what if it's one of the professors who targets me? Even you, and less than e greater than ranked individual would stand no chance against one of the professors there. Leaning back against the sofa, the tall man crossed his arms and frowned. What you say does indeed make sense. Dot but have you ever wondered? Would the lock, the world's leading academy stoop so low and target you? Someone who couldn't even be put on the radar by weaker forces. Looking back at Victor, he continued, I'd understand it if you were some big-shot crime boss, but you're merely a finance minister of a still-developing city. There's no way they would send a professor for the likes of you. Worst-case scenario they will just send a student, which in all said and done are not worth mentioning in front of me. Hearing what the tall man sitting before him was saying, Victor felt a bit more reassured. Dot but he still couldn't completely hide his worry. Dot yay but they are from the lock. Smirking, a black glow started emanating from the tall man's body. 
Soon an overbearing pressure bore down on everyone in the room. He, you think a bunch of students that have no real combat experience, let alone have ever killed someone are a match for me? Feeling the massive pressure bearing down on him, Victor quickly apologized. And no, I'm sorry I'm just nervous, noticing that he had taken things a bit too far, the tall man removed the pressure and said. Humph, when the time comes and if they really do show up, I'll show you the difference between me and them. Standing up, the tall man looked at Victor and said. Quote dot dot dot, you felt it just now didn't you? My power. Victor who was still recovering from the pressure the tall man had exerted before, nodded his head and said. I did, so there's nothing to be particularly worried about. Seeing how confident the tall man before him was, Victor bitterly smiled and said. Sigh, all right, there's a reason why I pay you so much Eldor. Well, for someone like me the amount you're paying could be considered a barg, dot HMM? Stopping mid-sentence, Eldor looked at the right side of the room. Squinting his eyes, he moved closer towards the edge of the wall of the room. What's this? Picking up a small device that was the size of a coin, the small device's color soon distorted from being the same color as the wall to slowly changing to the same skin tone as Eldor's fingers. Cryic, pinching the small device, Eldor looked at Victor and darkly said. Victor, start evacuating. Taken aback by Eldor's sudden change in Demonor, Victor's voice trembled as he looked at Eldor. W what happened? Looking at the powder in his hands, which used to be the small device he picked up, Elder slowly said. We have been breached, bzzzttt staring at his screen that had gone completely static, Kevin slowly removed his cashmere jacket and carefully placed it on top of the bike. Extending his hand to the right, a slick slender sword suddenly appeared in his hand. Unsheathing the sword, Kevin slowly traced his finger along the cold metal body of the blade. It's nice to see you again. Sheathing the sword back into the scabbard and placing it right below his waist, Kevin looked at the villa before him. Taking a deep breath, Kevin activated his F-ranked skill F-mind cleansing. As soon as he activated the skill, Kevin felt his head become clearer. Everything that he had previously seen on the drone became a bunch of variables that his mind slowly accounted for. Slowly, a plan started formulating inside of his mind. A plan that dictated the fastest route and way he could use to get to where Victor was, and swiftly get rid of him. Foo. Releasing a long breath, a couple of seconds after activating the skill, Kevin deactivated it. As soon as he deactivated his skill, veins started popping on his forehead as they pulsated constantly. Frowning, Kevin stopped himself from displaying any reaction and endured the pain that came along with using the skill. After a couple of seconds, everything returned back to normal, and the pain disappeared. Despite having only used the skill for a couple of seconds, it still did a number on him. However it wasn't for nothing. Now, he knew what the fastest and safest way to kill Victor was. Closing his eyes, slowly, his figure melted into the darkness. Dot let the hunt begin.